You can also look at the name part, that's true as well. Uh, I've been turning for about four and a half years, uh, started out by spending a week at John Campbell, and it was a life-changing moment. I was recovering from a minor brain injury that I sustained in a car accident, and I was having uh, some post-concussion syndrome issues. Little bitty concussion and a whole lot of difficulty getting back from that because of this post-concussion syndrome. Lots of headaches, and it was like, uh, it's like there was feedback in my head, you know, that you got, get that feedback overload thing, and it was like that constantly. So my wife said, you need a hobby, you're driving me insane. <laughs> Those were two separate statements. I always drive her insane, but I needed a hobby because apparently it was getting worse. And uh, I, tried, I tried this, I tried that, and uh, nothing was really sticking with me. So she said, all right, we need to go on vacation. You need to get out of town. Here's a catalog to this place called John Campbell Folk School. Immediately, I heard the word folk school. I don't want to go to a place called folk school. I'm a city kid. I don't, I, folk school? No, that's where hippies go. I don't want to learn how to weave baskets. That's no, I don't. I don't. I don't want to. Learn. Actually, I do now because I've been there. Um, but uh, long story short, we went there, and uh, the teacher was this tall, lanky cross between an old farmer and a hillbilly. Big hands, big feet, coveralls, long scraggly beard, and he was the wood turning instructor for this beginning class. And uh, wonderful human, Dave Berenger. If you ever have the opportunity to study with him, I strongly recommend it. He's a great teacher, and and this was a, a pure beginner class for non-experienced wood turners. And uh, the first day we were there, we went through the machines and the safety and the woods and the tools and the basics. And he said, "All right, now from for the rest of this." time before lunch. Here's a piece of wood. We're going to get you chucked up between centers. Here's three tools. Turn on the machine, keep your speed down, and just see what happens. And they'll walk through the class to make sure everything's safe. And I was having a bad day. Headache, didn't feel good. This, the feedback thing was going, so I figured, all right, we spent an enormous amount of money. We're here. Let's try it out. And uh, like I was telling a couple of the guys, I don't know that, I doubt that this is exactly what happened, but the way I remember it was the instant the tool touched the wood, my headache stopped. I mean, it just, parting of the waves, clouds spread, sun came out, angels singing, the whole thing. And then I hear, all right, machines off, tools down, it's time for lunch. It's like, no, I want to, no, I want to keep, I want to be a hippie. This is the coolest thing ever, and it made my head stop hurting. Uh, so we went through the week, and I had a great time, and before we were done, I had a $60 Craftsman lathe a single tube from the 80s oh. yeah with with a belt that went flappy 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 every time you turned it on and um, because of what it was it was a third horsepower and uh, I could not make bolts but I made pens I made hundreds of pens on this stupid little rickety thing and then somebody said hey if I give you money would you make me a pen <laughs> that's what you want. That's what you want to waste your money on. Absolutely. And then uh, somebody saw the pen that I made for this guy, and he said, "Hey, if I give you money, would you make me a pen?" Yeah, fooling this money. I'm good with that. If you want to buy my crap, that's fine. Um, but then other people started saying the same thing, and then I started doing shows, and and it was really just a hobby. Uh, but this thing has morphed over the last four and a half years into a full-time gig. So I've been a full-time, not a professional woodturner, I've been a full-time woodturner for the last uh, a little over a year. March 12, 2016, I went full-time. Uh, I left a 25-year career as a retail florist, and before that I was uh, a ceramics artist. So I've been, I've been making my entire life, really, uh, but that's where I'm really comfortable with the embellishment side of wood turning. So once I got the, the skill down enough that I could make some bowls repeatedly, I started dabbling with some of this other more cool stuff, or at least the stuff that I like to do. Uh, color and texture and uh, inlay and, and things of that nature, just to take, instead of doing round and brown cons always, don't get me wrong, I love round and brown, and, and if you get a good piece of stunning burl, nothing is better. But I can take a, a cheap piece of maple that's got a weird flaw in it, and I can cover it, I mean I can embellish it, and then call it art, and that allows me to charge more. So, um, <laughs> yeah, it's a method to my madness. This is a full-time gig, i got to make money, kids. Um, 
Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and pass this piece around. This is what I'm going to work on today. It's just a piece of uh, single A grade maple. Bought it at Rockler the other day. It had a, it's got a weird inclusion in here that was annoying me when I was uh, working with it this afternoon to get it ready for tonight. But I decided uh, this is this is what I do. I, I embrace the crappy stuff and see if I can't turn it into something better. Does it always work? No. But does anything always work? No. So you just uh, adjust and move. Um, I'm and I'm also a teacher, a wood turning instructor at the Craft Alliance in St. Louis. So uh, I've been I've been teaching as a full-time instructor for most of the last year as well. Uh, so I've got my business cards, all my contact information. Um, if you guys have any questions or, or want to talk or come out to my shop, if you're in St. Louis, you guys want me to come back and do more demos, I'm cool with that. Uh, if you just want to keep in touch and you know, see what kind of goofy stuff I'm working on, make sure you get one of my cards before we leave here. Um, Briefly about products, as as a product vendor, uh, which is really unfortunately where the majority of my money comes from, um, I am the only importer of a British product called Yorkshire Grit. Tom was talking about it. It's an abrasive paste, and if you've heard about it, it is absolutely every bit as good as they say it is. Uh, this product, in all honestly, honesty, I think is one of the best new products to ever hit wood turning ever and i've gone back and researched i've come i've done side by side comparisons with everything else like it this is the real deal and and if you want to talk about that um after the demo more than happy to talk about it i also manufacture under license from another gentleman in the uk the hampshire sheen wax line this one the u.s market either likes it or they don't it's a paste wax. It's a lot stiffer than most paste waxes that you're familiar with. Um, I really like it, but I like it because I made it and I understand it and I know how to work with it. So I, I don't usually push this one hard, but the Yorkshire Grits as good as it gets. Um, when I do my finishes, especially if I'm doing natural wood, this has been sanded to 220. I usually do power sanding um, just with the Velcro sanding disc, nothing, nothing in particular. Uh, I apply two coats of sanding sealer, which Tom was talking about, and I carry the Mylan's line. So two coats of Mylan cellulose sanding sealer, thinned 50-50. Um, you can buy empty bottles at Rockler that say Rockler and spend more money, or you can buy um, perm applicator bottles from the beauty supply place that don't say Rockler and spend a lot less money. So it's <laughs> six bucks or 250. I'm, I'm cheap, I'm a little lazy, I'll go with the cheaper bottles. Anyway, so I do uh, two thin coats of the sanding sealer, and then I apply the, the abrasive paste. Yes, sir? You said you thinned it 50-50, what do you thin it with? Lacquer thinner. Lacquer thinner. Lacquer based okay. product, I thin that one, thin that one just with lacquer thinner. Um, I prefer the low odor, but it, it, whatever's on sale at the big box store is what I end up walking out with. So. <laughs> If, if you're sensitive to the smell, yeah, I'm cheap, I can't help it. If you're sensitive to the smell, stick with the low odor, it's not as bad as regular. Um, just wipe it on, machine off, paper towel. Uh, the Yorkshire grit, you apply, power off, just a very thin coat, a little bit goes a long way. Uh, then you turn your machine on to about 500 RPM and start working it in. As you're working it, it actually has um, pumice, uh, a product called Rotten Stone, and then another abrasive stone that the manufacturer will not tell me what it is. So the secret ingredient. And as you're, as you're working it, you can feel like uh, sand. You can feel it underneath your paper towel. And as, as you're working it around, uh, that starts to break down and that's doing the sanding for you. So no dust, but you're working through the grits. The finer and finer this breaks down, the higher your grit goes. So I probably got to uh, about a 400, 450 grit finish on this after stopping with 220 paper, no fine dust, no other paper being used, and, and really just a little bit of that goes a long way. And then after that, on this particular piece, I used uh, the Hampshire sheet. So I'm going to pass this around while we go over the rest of what I'm going to do so you guys can get a look at the, fr at the back. Um, the front is unfinished. It is sanded to 320, and the reason why I do that is because I find that the aniline dyes that I use, uh, and I, I kind of prefer the Artisan brand from Craft Supply, um, much more intense colors. They're pre-mixed. You can use them straight out of the bottle. 
I don't have to. I don't have to have applicator bottles and and mix and whatever like you do with uh, trans tint and other products like that. And I find the trans tint, the color intensity is not as good as I like. I like the stronger colors because then you can do stuff like that. And this is just this is just airbrush dyed, and it's it's crazy simple to do. It looks really hard. It isn't. There's, there's shortcuts that you can do uh, to get this kind of technique and make it look like you planned out this big painting. I didn't plan anything except the hills, and technically the hills are a stencil. So I, I cheat. You know, I, I, I'm not an, an original artist. I, I, I'm a stenciler, basically. And, uh, but this is being able to do this and utilize other products from other uh, craft endeavors. This was my wife's when she was a scrapbooker. She had stencils for scrapbooking books. I, I don't know what she did with them, but I knew she had them. And I wanted to do this, this Southwest Utah looking inspired piece. And I knew that there was this stencil in the house somewhere, so I found it, um, <coughs> modified my design a little bit, and, and was able to pull off this piece. But it's not, there's about, uh, I don't know, the, the decorating process probably took me about an hour, and a lot of that time was just thinking about the proper steps to take in order to get the results. And there's a little, uh, looks like there's a, a sun or a moon element in there. Um, it was U.S. currency, it was a quarter. And I just put a little piece of scotch tape on it and glued it in place so it wouldn't move around sprayed over it when it was dry, lifted the quarter off, and I had this lighter circle that looked like a sun, or you know, either a setting sun or a rising moon. And it's really simple to do. You know, just put the quarter back in my pocket, went on about my day. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, as far as equipment goes, uh, protecting your lathe is paramount. I don't like cleaning any more than I have to. Um, so if I take precautions, by using this, uh, this professionally made, handmade, handcrafted uh, deflector shield, basically. Oh, I will be selling these in the parking lot. My truck's over there, 50 bucks cash, and, and we just don't talk about it. So we, you meet me outside after that. And, uh, but just, if you put plastic on here, there's a chance it could get sucked into the chuck. If you use a little cardboard shield, it's just going to, it might wobble around on you a little bit, but it's going to protect the important parts of your lathe. Um, because it's an alcohol-based aniline dye, the cleanup is just denatured alcohol. I didn't buy this. This, this. this bottle was given to me. I would not spend the money for a name brand bottle. But uh, I have one. So, huh? The perm applicator bottle. Yeah, perm applicator bottle is a whole lot cheaper. It's like six bucks or two fifty. That's I'm saving money all day long. But then that means I can buy other stuff. Um, Let's see, what else we got? All right, I'm gonna show you something along the lines of this piece. Tonight, uh, we're gonna use pre-made stencils. They come from Craft Supply in Utah. Uh, I'm not affiliated with them, except that's where my mentor works. My mentor is Kirk DeHear, and uh, basically he's the guy that has shown me most of the techniques in order to get these effects. Now, I, I know how to air, I already knew how to airbrush, I already knew how to do stencil work, I uh, knew how to do gilding wax, but I didn't know how to tie it together in order to work on wood. And the difference really is instead of using an acrylic paint or a watercolor or something like that, I'm using these aniline alcohol dyes. Uh, your work time is a lot, a lot shorter because they dry quickly, uh, but the effect, I think, you can get a much neater effect, a much more elaborate design in a very small amount of time with a very small amount of product and not a whole lot of effort. It, it looks really cool, but it's it's super simple. I'm gonna move my chair closer. Yeah, move your chair closer so that I can do the hand out. I got, I got two more. <laughs> All right, this one, uh, this is just a, a cool colored piece. It exacts, it's the reverse of the fall leaves, where the fall leaves, uh, like I'm gonna do for the demo tonight, I applied the fall color strategically on the on the bare wood and then I applied the stencil to cover what I wanted to have remain colored and then went over the entire thing with black and then you lift the stencil and you've got your your color on this one uh, we're painting through windows we take the reverse of the stencil so I've already used the inside die cut on the fall piece 
I'm using outside edge window. Apply that here and then I paint inside the, the stencil and the stencil protects the bare wood that I want to keep for this particular effect. And then uh, the gradient is just, you lay down your light color and you feather back over with your dark color. It's two colors. This is all just shading done naturally. Um, when the two colors combine, I went a little heavier in the center just to make it darker. I went a little lighter instead of making two or three full passes all the way out, which would give me a relatively solid line, I made a one pass of green, and then I made a second pass about uh, two-thirds down, and then the third pass was only about a third, and then I went a little bit heavier in the center to make that more dark, but then that gives me this gradient effect. And it's just by, in, instead of doing a full sweep of color, you only do a partial sweep, and then you do a little less, and you keep working that until you get what the effect that you'd like to see. Um, cool thing is, and there'll be one more after this. Cool thing with that, uh, with working with these alcohol dyes, is you can actually use alcohol in a paper towel to blend and feather and pull, thin out, wipe off completely. Uh, Jimmy Clues does a thing where he's got a, a, a very light but highly figured burl piece and he'll go over with a really dark color. He'll just spray the entire thing black or purple or something, a good dark solid color. And then he'll wipe it clean except for where it has soaked into the squirrely burly grain pattern and that highlights all of that pattern so that when you apply some other colors, some lighter tones, you've still got that really dark squirrely grain that's been emphasized and it shows up really well underneath your color. So when people say, well, how can you paint such pretty wood? And the short answer is I really don't paint the really pretty stuff. Sometimes I get lucky and the wood that I purchased or find or, or whatever that's not supposed to be uh, highly figured, you know, I will, I will buy single leg grade maple just because it's dry and I know it's not going to move or cause me any problem. But sometimes when I get in there, I find out that it's probably been mislabeled or they didn't know what they had and it turns out to be a double A or a triple A grade and it's way more figured and I might set it aside or I might use it on a, on a more um, elaborate project. Uh, but most of the time, I don't cover the really good stuff. Right, this, is, this is the last one I'll hand around. Um, this one is not airbrush, uh, but it is stencil work. And on some of these stencils, oh, and then the, the top color is milk paint that's been applied with sponge brush. I was told you can't do that. I was told you can't use milk paint on top of something like this and use it with stencils. Well, yeah, you can. <laughs> so if anybody says you can't, Maybe you can't, but maybe that gives you a reason to try something. Don't tell me I can't do it because I'll figure out how to do it. But it's all the same, it's all the same type of stencil work. And for uh, the feathers on that piece, those were purchased stencils uh, for the little Cocapelli guy and the, uh, the triangular geometric patterns. Those are off the wife's scrapbook stencil. And I was able to use a product called Frisket, and this is a, uh, it's a transparent film, a self-adhesive transparent film, low tack, you can apply it to the surface of the wood and then trace your stencil, and then using just uh, a sharp knife like an X-Acto, an X-Acto type knife, this is where it gets a little tedious, but you can then go around that, that drawing and cut out your own stencil, and just like we've been doing since we were kids, you just make your own stencil. Um, but then that opens up the world to, you're not limited to the purchased craft supply stencils. And you guys can come up and look at these, at, at what I have. Um, but they offer, uh, there's a flower pack, there's a butterfly pack, there's a poplar leaf pack, there's the fall leaves, which I need to buy more. There's plain sheets, which you can do the frisket trick. The adhesive on this is a little bit better. Um, but the, the process is exactly the same. Stick it to your bare wood, draw whatever pattern you want. You can use, um, you can either 
copy something off the computer and put a piece of carbon paper, you know, old school carbon paper and whatever, and, and draw out your pattern. Or you can use a, a hard stencil or, or do a CNC design on a piece of acrylic if you've got something, a custom logo or, or something. You know, you could do the Show Me Wood Turners club logo in the middle of a plate just by having somebody machine a stencil or something and, and hand apply and cut it out. Yes, sir. You're talking about the scrapbookers so before. They have machines and scrapbookers that will crickets. print out. Yeah, crickets. 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 They'll print it out for you, and you can lay that Frisco paper in there yeah. if you get the appropriate size. And it will print it out, and it will, it will cut it out for you. Yeah, yeah. So it's all ready to go. That, that That'd be a good because I know where there's a cricket. It's in my basement. We don't know where the power cord is, but <laughs> as soon as we find it. Um, as far as equipment for airbrush, you don't need a lot. You can start with, and, and I apologize, I was frazzled when I left home this afternoon. Uh, somebody bought a $900 phone on my credit card that I did not authorize, oh. and, uh, and it was not anybody that I knew, and it ended up delivered to my porch. And I found the box with somebody else's name on it with my address, so well, I opened it, you know, it's like, I don't know what this is. What is and then I discovered that it was uh, a fraudulent charge on my credit card, but the moron sent it to me instead of wherever they... <laughs> so, yeah, this afternoon was um, not good. I forgot to bring a couple of things, and if I'm a little scatterbrained, that's why. I just had a little more stress than I was anticipating today. Um, anyway, as far as airbrushing, if you're doing a solid color just or, or, or uh, a gradient color two or three colors but you're doing it on on a full plate you can use um, something that is it's the poor man's airbrush and basically it is it's called an atomizer and it's basically a, a blowpipe it's an l-shaped device that it has a straight blow tube that you blow through and then it's got a down pipe that goes into your little bottle of dye and these two tubes are on a hinge so you can clean it and store it and not bend it but when you open it up you're basically blowing it like blowing across the top of a bottle it's that kind of thing um, but you can put the down pipe in the bottle and blow across the surface of the piece and you can lay down color in a fairly controlled manner just relying on lung power you don't need compressor and, and brushes and all sorts of other equipment and the the blowpipes are eight bucks I know you can get them at craft supply I know you can get them at uh, Art Mart and I've seen them at either Michaels or Hobby Lobby locally I know you can buy them in town for less money than you can buy them at craft supply <coughs> um, you can go to uh, a standalone airbrush compressor Back in the days when we were doing ceramics, we burned through two or three of these. Uh, this is the last remaining dinosaur from a bygone era, and uh, it was probably purchased new in the late 80s, early 90s. It has done an enormous amount of airbrushing on ceramic product, uh, but when the ceramic business died out and the floral industry took over, this was put into a cabinet and didn't see the light of day again until about two years ago when I decided, you know what, I'm a wood turner and I want to do some airbrushing. So I found it, dug it out and started doing some airbrushing. Um, you can buy much more modern, much smaller versions of this for a whole lot less money comparatively than this cost when it was new. Um, again, craft supply, but Amazon and, and um, Michaels and Hobby Lobby, they've got a little airbrush section in their art department and you can just you can go and buy what you need if you like. You don't Do have you to. Use your top air compressor? <laughs> We've got one of those. Why? Because yes. <laughs> 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 yes, 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 you can. Yes, 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 you can. And all you need is this, really. Uh, this is a regulator. Um, you can I purchased this off Amazon. Uh, it's it's just an airbrush regulator that's designed to be used with a shop compressor. I've got a 20 gallon in my shop and when I'm airbrushing I've got a, a overhead line with a drop down and I'm, I'm able to just plug this into the quick connect. I had to change out a fitting or two but I can plug it into the quick connect on my airline, my regular airline and do everything that I need to do. Uh, the only drawback is 
the compressor has a tendency to kick on at, at very inopportune moments. So if you're, <laughs> you're really working on something and then and you, there's always that one because you jump. It's just the loudest damn thing. Um, but anyway, you can you can get these regulators at Harbor Freight, and even though even though it's a Harbor Freight tool, one you can return it as many times as you need to for a year or two after your purchase. But two, because it's a really low use, low impact device, it's not going to go bad, and it'll do exactly what you need to do. Um, the benefit to this one is it has. Uh, a way to remove moisture from your airline and I found out that if I don't have one of these I can actually uh, especially in summer uh, I'm in St. Louis and I'm sure the weather down here is exactly the same as up there you've got that million percent humidity in the middle of the summer and my shop is in my garage I don't have air conditioning I've got the door open a couple of fans going but as that compressor is running, you're getting cold air force through the line and, and the humidity in the air that's being sucked into the compressor and yada, yada, yada. There's some science involved. Uh, moisture has a tendency to build up and then it will shoot out, again, at inopportune moments, it'll shoot out onto your piece, usually screwing up what you're doing. And uh, it's just like somebody walking by and going, Puh. On, on your work surface and it's annoying, but this has got a little uh, a sponge and it will the air comes into here and it will suck the moisture out and contain it so that it doesn't go through your airline and back out and ruin your piece. Uh, you can also buy small quick connect devices. Um, I got these off Amazon. Um, I don't know if they're available anyplace else. I didn't spend a lot of time working with it, but uh, a couple of bucks on Amazon and it's just a, a mini quick connect that you can use to connect your gun to your airline just like you would any standard full-size airline and just a simple and and move on to your next your next brush um, I have four brushes with me only three are out on the table I'm only really going to use one I almost always only use one just because if you start with the lightest color and you work your way towards the darker tones you don't have to scrub the gun clean in between each color. Run a little denatured alcohol through it, blow it until it blows clear. Uh, paper towels are great for that. Um, I've got a, a gallon milk jug that I've cut a good size opening in that I shoved a lot of paper towels in and it sits next to my airbrush setup and I will just use that to capture my overspray when I'm cleaning out my gun. And that way, you know, you're dealing you're dealing with an alcohol-based dye. You're dealing with denatured alcohol. So you've got a lot of alcohol-type products that are being atomized into the air. Uh, I usually wear the the pink cartridge air mask when I'm doing this. Uh, another thing you want to avoid is breathing in all of these colors because uh, sneezing later that night or blowing your nose right before bed. Oh my God! because oh, you've got blue and green and purple in your Kleenex and it's just it's not necessary and, and I've, I've tested all of this stuff so trust me I've done the research so you guys don't need to um, but yeah just the, the pink cartridge because it will take care of particulates and fumes um, and then have just a place a station to uh, kind of clean out your brush as far as cleaning it out when you're done I don't always but if the gun gums up I've got two or three others in reserve and I'll get back to the one that doesn't work at some later date. Um, but again, it's just uh, denatured alcohol and a paper towel or Kleenex. You can disassemble it. There are some small pieces, so I suggest working in a well-lit area over a towel or a paper towel or something. And uh, for me, I can seal the, the gap between the table and, and my workspace with my belly. Um, but not everybody can do that, so just make sure you're working on the table, not at the edge of the table, because if you drop one of those little important bits, and it's going to be an important bit, you're probably not going to find it ever. Uh, so uh, just one of the, again, I've tested this. Um, what else? Uh, I think that's pretty much it on the setup. Any questions so far? Yes, sir. Where did you get your biscuit material? Uh, I got that off of Amazon and I just, I think I just typed in um, frisket film. Oh, uh, speaking of frisket type products, 
You can also buy, um, it's basically the same thing in a liquid form, and you can use uh, a small paintbrush to apply this frisket medium. Binfo uses this a lot on some of his work in order to lay down a matting in very precise locations. And then it works the same way. You, you paint it on, it dries, you do your, your painting or dyeing or whatever, and then you can use the tip of your X-Acto knife just to lift an edge and then you peel that back off and you don't have any color on the surface underneath where that was applied. So that's a, that's a good option too. Uh, this I think came from, uh, oh, this, this, this actually came from Hobby Lobby. I know it also comes at uh, Dick Blick and Art Mart. I've not seen it at Michael's, but Hobby Lobby is cheaper. Um, what else? Uh, okay, we're going to do, first we're going to do a little texturing. So the only turning I'm going to do tonight is texturing. And uh, I've got the back of my piece already finished, but I want to put a little detail on the rim. Best way to do that, in my opinion, is using um, the Sorby, one of the Sorby rotary tools. And I only brought one large Sorby because I don't have a lot of detail that needs to be handled. Have any of you used the Sorby spiral tool? One of these guys with the big rotary, uh, where's the can you see that in the camera? Okay. Um, the Sorby spiral tool is basically a rotary texturing tool. It comes with uh, three or four round cutting discs and these are toothed or grooved. There's one that actually has, actually comes to a point. So it is a bevel tool. It has a bevel. You use it by applying pressure on the bevel against the surface of the wood. You can also apply pressure straight on and that will leave a straight tick pattern. You can change things up by turning the tool to the left or to the right, changing the axis of the rotation, and that will affect the direction of your, of your texture. For me, since I'm going to do something, um, I'm gonna use the gear, I'm gonna use the gear stencil. All right, so we're going a little more uh, a little more steampunk, a little more industrial. So I just want to do uh, a textured rim like I did on the, the Utah piece. And uh, I'll do a little gilding wax right at the end just to bring up that, bring up and highlight that detail. So let's, uh, let's put this away because it's just kind of hot in here. Get the tool rest back up and do a little texturing. Best way to use a rotary texturing tool is to make sure you first have enough room in between your work surface and the edge of the tool rest. This needs to spin freely no matter what angle you're working at. The cutting surface needs to be at center of the piece. Now I haven't done a lot of texturing on the Delta 46 460 but it works just the same. The large Sorby tool Optimum speed is about 900 RPMs. Small Sorby tool, exact same type of tool, just in a smaller package, smaller wheels. And the Wagner style, which are knurling, they're knurling wheels. Um, these are working better at about 500 RPM. And you can change the appearance of your designs by adjusting your speed a little faster, a little slower. And one thing I learned uh, actually over the summer, I realized is if you're working on a large surface and you're trying to get similar detail in rows, so if I wanted to do kind of a scalloped edge right here at the rim and I wanted to do a second and third row of scallops, in order to get that pattern to look similar in size, I have to slow down my machine further out you get the higher miles per hour that edge is rotating so in order to in order to have this rotating at about the same speed as I move further out from center 
I need to turn my lathe down just a little bit. About 25 RPM, I think, will do it. Um, on this one, with no speed counter, it's kind of hard to dial in. Uh, but if you chuck up a piece of wood and just work with it, feel out how the tool works for you and what designs you like, uh, keep a piece of paper and a pencil handy so that you can write down, I did like this at this speed, I did not like that at that speed, and, and, and things of that nature. Uh, just, it's good to have notes for what you're doing so you can go back and repeat it later if you get something that you really like. All right, so all I'm going to do, I've got plenty of space here so that my cutting edge will rotate. Uh, I'm going to come in and I'm just going to do a straight, a straight cut that should make straight up and down tick marks around the rim of this platter. On this machine, we're running about two and a half on the dial. It looks an acceptable speed. It might be a little slow. And it's loud, so be prepared. And it's echoey in here. But you can see, if the light's right, you can see that it's created just a whole bunch of tick marks. Is that showing up? Okay. All right. When we get to the when we get to the the uh, gilding wax, that will really pop. All right. So hold your ears. I will do another another texture. And an, and another reason why it's screwing so bad is I'm on uh, a standard set of 50 millimeter jaws, but I'm working on about a 10 inch about a 10 inch diameter piece of wood. So my holding point is small, my work piece is of a larger size, and I'm working way out on the edge, so I got a lot of flex going, okay? If this, if I was doing this, um, if I was doing a lot of these, I'd have ear protection, okay? So, and, and I, my shop's not quite as echoey as, as this room. Hold your ears, I'll do one more, and then I'll put this tool down. I'm gonna come in, at a 45 degree angle and make so I've got more of a finer tooth mark here and I'm not really wanting a whole lot of texture I just want to give this little rim a little extra oomph now I also want to create a border on those Details. I want to. I wanna just want to add straight lines. Uh, simple way to do it. Long point of the skew. Long point down. Angle the tool in, and just make either a very tiny V groove or just just a straight line to make the groove. You could use um, a standard smaller size diamond parting tool. Instead of approaching it like you're making a parting cut, lay it down wide side and just go in with the point. I actually have a shop made. Uh, it's called a three-point tool because there are three sides and uh, what this is is one of my original Harbor Freight spindle gouges. This is my Harbor Freight detail spindle gouge and, and the, the main detail of this gouge is it doesn't work. So I pulled it out of the handle and I turned it around and there's a spindle gouge down here. It doesn't work. It's a very poorly made tool, but it's still high-speed steel, and the bar was good, so I flipped it over, shoved it back in the handle, and took it to the grinder, and I made three flat surfaces on it. Uh, so I have a series of surfaces that I can use as a scraper, and it's super simple to do. So if you have any, just any, any uh, tool steel, any uh, drill bit, high-speed drill bits, a drill rod, that you want to make simple tools out of, you can. All you need is a grinding stone and uh, a little patience. It will get hot when you're shaping it. Quenching is good, um, but this gives me a decent pointy surface that I can use to make a couple of in between these texture lines. If you're getting too much flex when you're way out here, you can put your finger behind for support. And I've just kind of added, I've got a lot of flex, so um, there's, a, there's a missed spot here, but it's just a demo piece, so I don't care. Um, but I've now created borders surrounding my texture, which adds another level of depth. And when I go to put the gilding wax on, it's really going to stand out, because the, the color wax will be on the high spots, and the base color underneath is going to be black. 
right, now the next thing that I need to do is find my pencil. In here. And I think everything else is going to be pretty much color application for the rest of the demo. Any questions so far on anything that I've done? Right. No? Yes, sir. Black plate you have. What kind of, what is that black? Is that black paint? Is it spray paint? Uh, or is it dye? On this one? It's uh, the same the same kind of dye. It's, it's just the black dye. Um, I've done spray paint. And the problem with that is it takes a whole lot longer to dry. So you put on a coat and you have to stop and wait for it to dry. But because we're in a wood turning shop, there's always dust in the air. If somebody opens a door, the dust is going to move. Uh, I've, I've ruined the surface of pieces, waiting for, literally waiting for paint to dry, because I ended up with a bunch of fine dust or, or bugs or, or wood chips or whatever. You know, you can't sweep up your shop while you're waiting for paint to dry. You just need to wait. Um, so I, don't, I found out that I don't like black spray paint as my top coat. And it also has a tendency to go on a little bit thicker so you'll end up not being able to see as much of the grain underneath and because it's a wood piece even though i'm adding um, texture and color and and whatnot i want people to know that it's still a wood piece that's why i leave the backs natural as a rule and um, why i prefer to work just with the dies because it goes on really thin and they can still see the wood grain underneath okay All right, now because I'm using these gears, I kind of want to line out where I'm going to put them. And because it's got this really weird, funky inclusion here, I want to work over there with the color. Not to cover it up, but to maybe help enhance it a little bit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to prep a couple of the gears Get the die cut snippets out of there, the hanging chads. Line them out, and I'm just going to make a little uh, little vignette on my work piece. Now, laying out the design, this is where 25 years in the floral industry comes in super handy, is because all I'm doing with my stencils is lining out basically how I would work on a floral wreath where you've got your wreath form and basic wreath design works well with the eye when you have a larger group of color in the floral industry would be flowers or ribbon or both and then on the opposite side you've got a smaller anchoring point that not only helps balance the piece even though I've got a lot of color here because I also have some color here on a round surface, it creates balance. If you turn it straight up and down, your eye is going to naturally go from the small to the large. If you turn it at a slight angle, you've now got design. Charge more. Um, it's visually appealing. I, I don't really know the, the reasons behind that, but because it creates this visual balance, it becomes a whole lot more appealing than just uh, a random grouping of things on every single piece. So by lining these out in advance, taking my little gears, I'm going to line them out in advance and determine the areas where I want to have the color to begin with. So on this piece, All I'm going to do is put this into a position like I would set it up for a floral wreath. So I know I, want to, I know I want to have the big gears, the bigger group of gears here, so that this weirdness ends up with a greater chance of being visible when I'm done. So I would line this up so that there, there is my axis. I wouldn't do it straight across, I'd line it up in a design orientation. This is my focal point. I want this to be where the biggest group of color is. So I'm going to set this up in an angle. And I'm just going to start adding these gears in. And maybe I want them to touch and maybe I don't. But I'm just trying to get an idea 
of the layout and how I want things to work. I like using different sizes. I like playing with the positioning, you know, something a little bit higher, something a little bit lower. There's no real rules regarding the placement, so this is completely up to you, however you would like to do it. And the only reason why I'm doing this is to provide that design foundation. One more little, just one more little. Believe it, if you screw it up, you go back in the lady, cut it off. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's, a, that's actually absolutely true. That if you screw it up, because you're just working with dye, chuck it back up, sand it clean, turn it clean, whatever you need to do, start all over again. Uh, that, that's also why I have a tendency to leave myself a little more mass. I could put a texture on the rim if I wanted to, but reality, I have room to cut it off sand it off, start all over again if I, if I want to, if I screw up. All right, so I've kind of got, kind of got this laid out in a manner that I want. And this is where I have the cell phone camera. Hopefully that wasn't purchased by <laughs> Comes in handy that I can take my phone and I can just snap a quick picture of the placement of the gears that I can refer back to later. I'm also going to take my pencil and I'm going to kind of draw around where these gears are set up because that's going to allow me to know where I want those base colored paints. I could paint the whole thing with color and then put the gear stickers back on and then paint the whole thing with black if I wanted to. But if I line out what I'm doing, I've got a better shot of getting uh, control of where the color is applied. Instead of being a large surface random pattern, I can now say, okay, maybe I'm wanting this gear to be more purple, and I'm wanting this gear to be more green. I have an idea where the gears are going to end up on the final piece just by drawing a little bit around them. And then you're, you do it light enough, your pencil mark, will just kind of disappear when you apply the black color. All right, and then something else I've done, I don't know what I'm talking today. Something else I've done is I've managed to make up my, mix up my stickers. So when I remove these from the surface, my short pile goes in the short pile, and my large pile goes in the large pile, and I keep the two piles separate so that I don't screw myself up later when I'm trying to figure out what in the world I was doing. Because some of the sizes on some of these uh, stickers are very similar. And if you, don't, if you don't do a decent job in your setup, you could screw yourself up design-wise later. And then from here, we're just going to chuck this right back up. Not a lot of pressure because the, the lathe is going to be off for the most part for the rest of the demo. All right, so I've got my shield. I have got paper towels to go down on the ways because I don't want to have to clean that when I'm done. I made a really cool tie-dye piece and I've, I'm sorry, but I forgot to bring it with me. But the stencil for that is this. I can hand that around just because you seem to be falling asleep and you need I to know move. I need to <laughs> <laughs> stand up. Stand here. Anyway, I did, uh, I, I did a, a tie-dye. And in order to get the tie-dye look, I had a big piece of just light-colored maple, turned it, sanded it, and took the airbrush, starting with my yellow, and I just started making swirls, like a tie-dye shirt would look like. So I started with the yellow, and I left some empty, unpainted surfaces, then I went over that, I did a little more with orange, and then red, and then blue, and green, and purple, and, and just kind of made a really random color pattern, because that's what tie-dye is. And then I put the frisket over the entire surface, I put the uh, stencil over the frisket, I stood there with my little pencil, and I drew in all of those little empty places, 
and then I took my X-Acto knife and then I had to go back and I had to cut around all of those empty places and then I lifted off um, the positive which would which when the frisket came off it looked exactly like the stencil okay so I lifted off a, a copy of that but I left all of those little windows sitting down on top of the color painted the whole thing black and then uh, before the before the dye dried too much I had to lift all of those little plastic windows off but then that exposed all of that random color and it was really an experiment it worked out great and I forgot to bring it and I apologize but I got a picture on my phone if you would like to see that later and uh, let's start doing some start doing some painting anyway like I said this stuff is ready to use right out of the bottle I normally use a plastic pipette walked off without it I apologize um, but I keep little little eyedroppers in my color box don't ask me why because I really don't know they were just in there and I'm glad uh, because now I can get the paint out of the or I can get the dye out of the bottle without dumping it and you really only need a very small amount of color in order to do this so I'm going to start with my lightest color which is yellow and I, I really am going to lay down color in most of these areas that I've defined with the pencil. Uh, overspray is acceptable because the whole thing is going to be covered in black later. Spray, uh, getting this on the rim, completely acceptable because the rim is going to be solid black until we get to the gilding wax. Press the glove back in. Um, it does stain your hands. Denatured alcohol does get most of it off. Wear a glove. Just And I have discovered that I think I like using my big compressor with a regulator better. I just think it gives me uh, a bit more control, a bit more consistency with what I'm with what I'm working on. And this compressor has got some miles on it. Very small amount of paint to dye. Are you under 40 psi? Uh, about 20-25 when you're working with a compressor. I don't know what this compressor is rated for, but if, if you're working with um, the regulator on a full-size compressor, about 20-25 psi is all you really need. All right, so just on a two-stage air brush, when you press your finger down, only air is moving through the brush. When you pull your finger back, color starts to come out of the brush, all right? You can control how much color comes out by how far you pull this trigger back. On a single-stage air brush, it's one and done. You, you press and the amount of force you press on the single stage brush will control both airflow and color flow. This is, has a lot more control that I can get in here and I can start with just air and then open it up and I can start seeing some color come out and I can move in closer to get more intense color. I can move further away if I want and right now, all I'm really doing is laying down uh, basically a base coat so that when I apply the next color, which is going to be red, I will have yellow and orange and red because it will mix itself. All but I really like having, I really like having uh, the ability to have light tones in most of what I do. It just, it just gives you uh, a little more depth of color, I think. And then, uh, like I said, very small amount of color. I'm pretty happy with that. If I had my milk pitcher here, I would just dump the, my little uh, cup out. Denature it up the hole. 
rinse. Because it's alcohol based, uh, the paper towel dries pretty quickly. And because we're working through starting lighter and going to darker, it doesn't make a whole lot of difference whether or not you clean the entire brush out. Are those colored fast dyes? Um, I'd have to read the bottle. And, and by color fast, you mean resistant. Uh, premium coloring design, dyes are quick drying, pre-mixed wood dyes perfect for creating colored effects, blah, 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 blah. Uh, highly fade resistant. That's it. It's highly fade resistant. So probably not color fast or UV resistant. But um, I don't normally put my pieces in areas of bright sunlight because I know that can affect the color of the wood. I think just by not having it in the sun, you'll be fine color-wise. So you warn your customers? Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm a full disclosure kind of guy, so I try to make sure everybody knows what they have when they take one of my pieces home. Alright, now I'm going to run the risk of doing a little color mixing inside the bottle, but for the sake of demo, you guys are worth it. Normally, I've got a cup full of uh, their, their pipette bulbs, plastic pipettes, and I have one for each color so I don't have any uh, color contamination in between. Next we're doing red. Because it's red, we're also going to get some orange. And I'm just going to do, again, I'm just doing little, little circles and going around inside of my colors. Because it's going to be a little more industrial, I'm going to stay away from the fall, you know, the fall type colors. There will be more variety, and these are going to darken down a bit more. But this is really all it is to it. You just keep going through your colors, lighter to dark, and, and have some fun with it. it it's all—it's uh, a process of experimentation. It's a process of discovery. Every piece is going to be a little bit different, and for me, that's part of the fun. That I don't want—I don't want 16 pieces that all look the same. Unless I have a customer that wants 16 pieces that look the same, and I, I really hope I don't get those customers. <laughs> I'll, I'll do what they want, but I'd rather do what I like. That makes sense. That make me a bad person. No answer. Uh oh. Uh, we're gonna do. We're gonna skip green. We're gonna go to blue. Try really hard not to spill entire bottles of dye. Don't ask me how I know that. Right, now I'm going to start laying in some darker colors to give myself a little more heavy of a look. And I'm going to be a little more linear because we're working with the gears, and hopefully that will hopefully that will create kind of a cool effect.
think you work mainly with the, uh, the maple? On uh, when I'm doing color, I'll do maple, poplar, uh, ash, oak. Not not usually oak because it has uh, such a, a, a deep open grain pattern, and then it's got those rays sometimes. Um, but the the lighter color woods just take color better. You know, if I'm doing um, if I'm doing uh, full coverage uh, embellishment, like if I do. Um, a reactive metal paint and that's a whole other demonstration uh, but basically you take uh, a, a paint that has metal powdered metal suspended in it you apply it to the surface of your wood and you apply a second coat while that second coat is still wet you spray it with an oxidizing agent that will force the natural oxidation of the metal but what normally takes 10 years happens in about an hour so it's a really cool painting technique um, but because it's really made for taking a piece of wood and making it look like a piece of old metal you want to cover the entire piece and I find using like walnut for something like that where the wood itself is a little bit more heavy and the grain structure is a little bit more heavy and I know that the, some of the fibers are going to lift so it's going to give me uh, a physical texture as well as this neat painting effect because the I know the fibers going to lift and uh, I, I'll use that for the metal reactives but because it's such a dark wood, I'm not going to use it for something like this. All right, I'm going backwards in color. I'm going to a really dark magenta. I should have done this after red. That's all right. You know, I, I really don't have any plan. I'm just, I'm just winging it. And I hope you guys are enjoying what I'm doing, or at least getting an idea that this really isn't that complicated of a process. You don't really need that much in equipment. You don't have to be an artiste. Again, I'm wanting some more linear effects going across that blue just because I'm hoping it's going to look really cool when I'm done. One more color, we're going to do purple, and then we'll move on. How am I doing on time? What time do you guys normally get out of here? You've got another day and a half. Another day and a half. Alright, this looks like a mess right now, but that's alright, because the stencils are going to add the definition that we need to turn this into a cohesive piece. Alright, now with this last darker color, I want to make sure I don't have any light spots to speak of. I want to make sure that this is all filled in with some kind of Okay, and that, ladies and gentlemen, is how you put airbrush on a platter. Thank you very much. I'll see you next time. <laughs> Uh, not very. Um, minute, minute two. Yeah, there's not, I, I'm throwing away way more color than has been applied to the piece. Just, just by having enough color in the brush to do this and then cleaning it back out again, I'm wasting way more than's on, than is on the piece of, of wood. Yeah, a couple of drops, maximum. 
And then on a small piece like this, you need even less because I'm not doing full coverage with the colors. Now the black, I go through a lot of black because I have to cover the whole thing and I've got to do it enough so that the coverage is solid. So while I've never, I've never had to buy new bottles of any of the individual colors, I've had to replace the black twice. Okay, so hard part. And so far I've managed to not ruin your leg. Demo's not over yet. We got a long way to go. All right. Best way to put the appliques on is with the piece sitting flat in front of you. Uh, they will stick to your glove, so remove the glove or have somebody else put your application back down. All right, I've got my short stack. My short stack goes in the short pile. Yeah, can you still see your pencil marks through that? Yeah, yeah, I can still see the pencil marks. And, and if you have trouble because it's graphite, you just lean a little bit, um, you're going to get the shine off the light. Yeah, you guys, it's going to take a couple minutes. You guys can cycle up here and, and take a look at what it looks like now if you'd like. So I've just, I've just drawn around where I want this larger gear to go, and that's just going to lay down right there inside the pencil box. Do you have to use pressure to seal it? And when I get them all on, I will yeah. rub down in order to get a, a good seal. Because, I, because it's dyed, the downside is you, it can underneath, run underneath, yeah. but on this, and because it's alcohol based, it dries so fast, you get a good seal, you don't have that bleed over. What's the smallest bottle of dye that you um, You could probably go. You could probably go to Trans Tint at Woodcraft or Rock, where they they have smaller bottles. Um, like I said, for me, it's all about it's all about color intensity. Uh, these are four ounce something. About four ounces. Did I know? I think you'd get like an ounce or two. Small bottle like I know you can of, of the other products, and then I know you can also get a small bottle of um, transparent airbrush acrylic paint. You can get, you can buy thin acrylic paint and run that through a, a standard airbrush exactly the same way. It's a little bit thicker, and and you really have to clean the guns at that point um, because of the dry, which could screw things up. Now are those cut from your cricket? No, sir. These are purchased. Uh, sells an assortment of these stencils, okay. and they've they've got uh, a couple different kinds of leaves. They've got the feathers. They've got the gears, uh, snowflakes. Uh, they've got snowflakes and butterflies, uh, bees, all, all pre-made. So you can you can buy packs of these. If you don't have access to that cricket thing, or you can buy the roller frisket and cut out any shape you want and make your own stuff as well. Do you deal with Martin Saban on a regular basis? Yes. Yeah, he's the guy that he's answered for. I work for him, yeah. so I, I deal with him daily. <laughs> Seems like a pretty nice gentleman. He's, he's a good guy. And are you going to be able to make it to Kansas City? Yes. Uh, make sure you stop by booth 320. that will be my booth. Uh, Martin and Glenn Sr. will both be coming from the oh, UK. Oh, really? Great. They're, they're coming and they're going to be in my booth. And we're going to be... Three uh, booth 320. Booth 320, yeah. Great. I'll be there.
Now, what is the thickness of these blanks that you're buying? Are you buying a four quarter or are you getting an eight quarter? I'm buying bubble blanks. I have no idea. They're, they're about that thick. Okay, so them. eight quarter, two okay. inch. Yeah, but about two inch thick. And and they're cut they're, they're cut rounds. They're usually special price. I get them at Rockler. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, I, I get them at Rockler in uh, St. Louis. And uh, just walk in there and walk. Hmm. Why would I need it? You know, can I can I cut them and buck them and process trees myself? Yeah, sure I can. I want them. <laughs> and I know it's kiln dried, so I know that I'm going to be able to cut it up and do what I want right away. If I'm just doing if I'm just doing regular bowls, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tend to process my own blanks at that point. But if I'm for these for these painted bowls. I would much rather use a purchase blank simply because I know I know it's already dry and I don't have to screw it. So I can you know I can bring home a stack of bowls, go right to work. I don't have to rough them and let them dry for six months. I bought an airbrush last year. Yeah. Can't get it to work. But you've given me enough information. Okay. I'm ready to go. Alright. You ever get into St. Louis? Oh yeah, all the time. Okay, well if you can if you can justify the trip, come up to my shop. Say, hey, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going to be in St. Louis and where are your cards at? I want to grab one of your cards. Well, I'm here for okay. Us. Yeah, we're up in Florida. I'm up in Florida. Go right. Ahead. How familiar with the area are you? Born and raised up there. All right. Uh, oh, you're the Walnut Law. I am the Walnut Law. Yeah, I am. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> I don't know what you want me <laughs> uh, 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 yeah, because I look for the. Uh, Patterson and Holster. I was born and raised on Versailles, right off of Humes. Yep, yep, yep. Patterson Road, right up in there. Alright. Alright. I just lay down these, uh, these decals, basically. And that's going to protect the color underneath. I'm just going to go with the whole thing with black, lift the decals, and I'll, I'll still have the color that I'll show through. And then you can do it with any stencil type. On the fall ones, I did the exact same thing as this, except they used yellow, then red, and a little orange, and a little green. And, and, and I. You can kind of see pencil mark here if you angle the light right. Same trick. I just drew. I, I laid them out before I stuck them on. Drew around them so I knew where to lay down the color. Laid just random colors all over the place. Do as heavy as you want. Do as light. Are you running a Are you running a clear finish over this? Yeah. And, 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 and it has a. I'm a photographer, okay. and it has a little bit of a metallic finish to it. Yeah, if, you ever, if you're familiar with metallic paper, yeah, it has just a slight. These colors here have that slight metallic paper look. I do. Uh, I'll do a spray lacquer. So uh, I prefer depth high gloss. Yeah. Just bring a little brown can. I'll have my lathe set up so that it will be at about 165 RPM when I pull the switch. So I'll have my piece on here. Spray the whole thing with lacquer. Thin coat, turn it on, yuck, 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 yuck. just let it rotate, that eliminates runs. Okay, if you put if you spray it with the piece uh, rotating, you're encouraging runs because the wet paint's hitting the surface and the of the force is pushing it out. So if you're doing a clear coat, you just want to spray the whole thing, then turn on your machine and let it rotate while it dries enough to not run to not run down when you turn off. And for how long? Uh, 15, 20, 30 seconds. Oh, okay. Long enough to walk over to that table. And yeah, I've seen some guys on YouTube just let it run and run and run and run and run. Oh, no, I don't have time for that. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, you know, that's the story of my life. I don't have time for that. I need to, I need to get this done, get you guys out of here, and move on to my next piece is, is, is what I'm doing. That's really neat. I like that. Alright, well, I'm, I got my decals on. We're ready to go on to the next step. Okay, so. here. 
get out of the way here. By the way, a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Really, I'm really learning a lot. Good, good. Really. And, and seriously, you have my card here. If you have a question, I'll be out phone. If, if I don't know the answer, I know the people that do. I am, I've been wanting, uh, I, I had this crazy idea of trying to get a hold of Saban and see if there's a way that I could sell his product. Uh -huh. But I wanted to buy it first, and, and that's why I found out about you, the one that went on there. But, okay, I need to do that. Well, you're here. So, <laughs> I, want to, I want to try some of that. Okay. All right, you guys. From our previous episode, your intrepid hero has managed to adhere all of the uh, die-cut stencils onto the surface of the wood, pretty much where I had them lined out um, when I took the photograph during my mock-up. All I'm going to do at this point is spray the whole thing in black. I got a question. Why yeah. don't you just spray it flat? Is there a reason why you put it back in the way and spray it flat? Yeah, actually there is. We were talking about it up here. Um, I want, if you're spraying a liquid onto a horizontal surface, you have the chance of running, okay? Normally, I worry about that when I'm spraying a gloss finish on, on top of these when I'm done, is I will have the lathe set up at a very low speed, about 165 RPM. I'll spray on the color. I'll turn on my machine, and it will rotate slowly, and that will eliminate... Uh, runs in certain sections. If I turn the machine on first and then apply the spray, it's going to run the risk of using centrifugal force to create runs on the surface where I don't want them. So depending on how the color reacts as I'm spraying, and because I've got several plastic surfaces, I want the ability to be able to turn it on and minimize any running if I need to. Now hopefully with the dye it's not going to be a problem and I'm not going to do a spray finish here just because it takes way too long and none of us need to be breathing those kinds of fumes. Alright, we use a lot of black. do my best not to spill it on myself, on the floor, on the machine, on any of you. I'm not going to make any guarantees. Alright, this is easy. This is just paint. Now, I could, I would rather have this moving at a much slower speed. Yeah, I, I know, I know we can, but I just want to try to get this to a point where you guys have an understanding of what I'm doing. Because I can always go back. I can always go back and finish later. Did I mention we use a lot of black? Hey Tom, you want to come up and help me a minute? What? You want to come up and help me a minute? Yeah. Yeah. Grab a pair. Grab a pair of gloves here and just keep feeding the gun, if you would, please. Because I want them to be able to see the gilding. Be able to lift the decals as well. No, I want you to use that little eyedropper, but because that bottle is used, you have to get over the paper towel and you got to tip it. Yeah, just like yeah. that. Okay. 
Good. Good for now. This is what happens when you win. You get to be my helper. Hey, boy, gloves. <laughs> Again. Uh, it depends on what it's looking like. Sometimes the colors uh, cover easily, sometimes they don't. I think that has more to do with how much patience I have in the process. If I'm moving fast, I might not always give the base colors enough time to set up before I move on with the black. Uh, so at that point, I might need to add a second, third coat. Uh, it also depends um, on the texture. How well the texture is taking if I'm doing a good job if I'm getting the color into all the grooves that I need to get into I don't know if you can see this on the screen but right through there I'm still seeing some of that red coming through yeah but if they come up and check my work I'll be in trouble Right, because I got the shield here, I'm also being uh, aware of where my spray pattern is, and I'm kind of just working in the same quadrant of the workpiece in order to make sure that I still have this protector behind me, um, and just rotating the piece by hand. This will probably do if you want to cap it. Okay. Put that right there on that. Put the lid on there. Appreciate it, sir. And I can always go back with um, a paintbrush and the dye and touch up anything that I miss. I can go over the rim with a Tombow art marker. Don't use Sharpie. Sharpie black is technically not black. It is actually a purple, very dark purple pigment. And if you get the light just right, you'll be able to see that. All right, this is basically it. Uh, I'll let it sit long enough to get the majority of the color out of the brush so I don't have as much to clean up later when I get home, which translates into tomorrow or the next time I go to do color and find out that my brush is still dirty. All right, that's good enough. All right, I can still see an awful lot of color, so I'm going to have to do some touch up when I get back home. But for demonstration purposes, you're going to get an idea of how this works. Now, because I'm working with a sharp knife, I can get in underneath the decals. It's still a sharp knife, and I have to be aware 
of the position of my finger is in relationship to the blade. I have not tested this theory. I don't want to. <laughs> Uh, and, and for me, I'm right-handed, so I'm only working off the very point of the point. I'm not messing with the cutting edge for this process. All I want to do is get that point into the um, die cut and lift it enough that I can peel the sticker off of the surface. And if I do it right, I don't even end up scratching the painted surface underneath. Normally, I would let this dry a little bit longer. Also, normally, the surface of the black will be a whole lot more solid. But I want you guys to be able to see the reveal. And I want to do a little gilding on the rim. Uh, the downside of working with these uh, stencils is you do have to get them off the surface of the wood. Depending on how much color you apply, you could run the risk of the, the die cut lifting and rolling as the color dries. It'll kind of crinkle up and that could cause smears across the clean, crisp edges that you just worked so hard to make. Yes, I will not be able to reuse these because I'm not taking the effort to save them. If I wanted to reuse them, I'd take this and I would grab the plastic sleeve that it came in and I would stick it down on that plastic sleeve and then I can take a paper towel or a Kleenex or something with some denatured alcohol and I can wipe some of this color off. But you have to do it fast again. If the edges start to roll, as the color dries, you're done. You'll never be able to get them to stick down properly. Is it really cost-effective to do that, On purchase stencils, it would be because I could get two or three uses out of them. You know, because all I'm doing is yeah. color clean, color clean. Yeah. All right, so... The darker black, you'd have to reapply the stencils just lay it back on, correct? At this point? Yeah. No, no, I would, I would have kept... I would have kept on doing the airbrush. I mean, uh, from right now, since you pull them off. Oh, I'll probably, if I do anything, and I might, I might just leave it just because it's a demo piece. If I do anything, I'll, I'll get a, a fine paint brush, and I'll just, I'll just paint it. And, and I'm okay with that because, like I said, I did ceramics for years. It's, it's not a big deal. Um, if I was doing this for a finished piece. I would not have pulled the stencils at this time. I'd wait until the black surface was perfect or perfect enough. Um, but just so that you guys get an idea of what I did, you know, it's that's it's just that simple. I'm not there's not a lot of fine art going on here, but it looks pretty darn impressive. Even though you guys know the black surface isn't complete yet. Okay, if this was solid black like the fall piece and then dried and then sprayed with a clear gloss, it would be stunning. So I'll, I'll make sure I get this finished and send a picture to the to the group or something when I'm done. Just, just send so, a flight. Huh? Yeah. Oh, just send a flight? Okay. <laughs> I might. I might. You don't know. <laughs> All right. Gilding and then we're done. So can I get on the blue plate right now? Huh? You're not going to let them pass the plate up, right? No, we're not going to we're not going to pass the plate. <laughs> you can more than welcome to come up and look uh, when we're done, but it's uh, it's still very wet, and I don't want you guys running the risk of getting your hands all full of stuff. Yeah, we'll just do it with the fingers. Um, Gilder's wax. Has anybody worked with Gilder's wax? Okay. All right. Uh, the kind that I like to use is called Baroque Art. Uh, again, it's a craft supply purchase. The reason why I buy a lot of stuff from Craft Supply is because they have the best rebate program in the wood turning supply industry. Every dollar I spend gets me a point percentage and they give you a cash discount once you get X number of points. Um, for me, I spend a lot of money on supplies and whatnot, so I want to be able to get that rebate. And, and they support your club, they support our clubs, they support clubs all around the country, all around the globe, and, and give out the... the uh, coupon vouchers and whatnot so I like 
I like giving back to the companies that are given to us, and that's the only reason why I push craft supplies. Uh, this is a product that can be applied with a brush. It can also be applied by hand, and that's the way I'm going to do it tonight. Normally, I'd be wearing a glove. He used my. No, you know what? I brought it. Super simple. Make sure, especially if you're wearing a latex glove, that the gloves are pushed down on your fingers so that you have uh, a tight latex surface over your finger pads. If you have um, wrinkles or, or loose places where the latex is not making good contact, you could end up either putting too much coloring into the grooves of your detail and ruining it that way, or you could end up just not getting hardly any color on the grooves at all. So, simple step, push the fingers down. What I like to do is I like to start by loading my thumb. Best way to do that is just come in here and start rubbing some color on. Yeah, yeah. I'm just I'm just loading up my thumb. All right. With my thumb loaded, I can transfer it to my index finger in a much lighter and now smoother coat, right out of the tin. It's kind of thick and lumpy. I just smoothed it out and applied it to my brush, which is my index finger. And all I'm going to do is rub carefully across the surface. And then I can reload from my thumb and I can rub across the surface. Now you can see the dye is not dry yet. So I'm, I'm pushing this in order to give you guys an idea of how it works. Uh, it's also a little crumbly. Uh, this is mineral spirit based. If it dries out on you, this is one of the few gilding waxes that you can actually go back and reconstitute afterwards. All right, I'm going to cheat just so that you guys can see what I'm doing. And I'm going to apply one heavy coat with my thumb. Normally, I would be applying three or four very thin, very controlled coats. I don't want to get wax on anything except the detail grooves, okay? You can see I just applied a little copper right here. Uh, it also comes in silver, gold, ink and gold, uh, iris blue, ruby red, and a patina color which I'm going to use next. And I'm just going to take this raw copper and give it just a hint of vertigree. And all I'm going to do is double gild right on top of it. just to kind of age it just a little bit. Yeah. Alright, it's not a great job, but you get the idea. Okay. So, it, when you come up, you can see the copper and then you can see the green gilding on top. And in, by doing this on top of the black base coat, which is on top of the texture, I'm now creating a level of depth that is very visually appealing and it makes that small amount of texturing work really pop. Um, and that's basically it. I mean, I've got, I've got a lot of work to do to finish this. Normally, I would spend more time on the black and the gilding and whatnot, but this is basically how you make an airbrush piece. You, know, you can do way more elaborate processes if you want. It's a great way to start though. Jeff, is the uh, gilding, is there any colors that work a little easier than uh, some bronze? The silver shows up better on black, gold shows up better on black, but the reason why I went with the copper is because I'm doing this industrial thing, and, and if you do it right, that's all this rim is. It's texture tool, black base coat, then the copper, several, several properly applied coats of the copper, and then the verdigris on top. And then when I go to spray it with my spray lacquer at the end, the colors kind of meld together and everything darkens. This is a little bright, 
but I'm okay with that because I know that when I'm done and I spray it, it's going to tone it down just a little bit more and it'll look every bit like real aged copper like this room does. Okay? All right, that's it for the demo. You guys have any other questions? Anything I can tell you about?